Hello, everyone, and welcome to this talk. Um, I am Arene Onel from Stu University, and I'm the moderator for this talk. It is my pleasure to introduce the speaker today. She's Catherine Mann um, from Cornell University in USA, and her title is Groups Acting at Infinity. Thank you. Uh, so this talk is about uh, a philosophy or a, a fruitful perspective uh, for, for studying rigidity of group actions. Okay, so the broad, broad theme, this is the kind of theme you can even sell to a non-mathematician, is to find examples of dynamical systems. And for me, a dynamical system is a group, a discrete group acting on a space, typically a manifold. I want to find examples that are stable under perturbation. Right? The selling point is, right, this is understanding the phenomena that differentiate stability from chaos. Now, stability and perturbation can mean different things. To illustrate this, I'm going to show you the babyest example, where my group is an infinite cyclic group, right? So I just have to tell you what a generator is doing, and my space is the unit interval. So here's an example. On the left, I've drawn the graph of a function, a homeomorphism of the interval. And on the right, a more suggestive dynamical picture, which tells you behavior of points under iteration. I have a single fixed point, and the other points get attracted towards this as I iterate. Now, if I take a C1 perturbation, meaning that uh, I take a homeomorphism that's pointwise close with derivatives also close to the original, I will say, see qualitatively the same behavior. A single fixed point that's an attractor, I get something that's topologically conjugate to my original picture. Typically not C1 conjugate, the derivative and the fixed points and the invariant that might change, but, uh, but conjugate by some change of coordinates. If instead of C1 perturbation, I'm a little looser, I don't control derivatives, I take a C0 perturbation. Well, now I can see some propagation of fixed points. I get something that's not necessarily conjugate. Uh, I could see it, maybe you know, a whole intervals worth of fixed points. My picture looks like it has finitely many, but actually that's just bad resolution. I put a whole canner set worth of fixed points in that little interval. Um, all kinds of things can go wrong. And yet I can return to my original picture if I just allowed myself something epsilon away from a conjugacy, I collapsed the interval in which all of these fixed points propagated down to a single point. And that motivates the following definition, which will appear a concept that's kind of key to this talk. Uh, it's the sort of best type of stability under perturbation you can hope for for C0 perturbations. And so my definition is a action of a group on a space is C0 are topologically stable. If any sufficiently close action, meaning you know, if your group's finitely generators, the generators go to pointwise close maps, any sufficiently close uh, action is not conjugate, but semi-conjugate to the original, meaning just like the example above, there's a continuous surjective map from the space to itself that intertwines the action with its perturbation. As you notice, this definition is inherently asymmetric. The perturbation it has to sit above the original. Uh, this forces a perturbation to retain at least as much complexity or dynamical, uh, dynamical complexity or information as the original. For instance, um, you know, if you take an individual element, the entropy of it, the topological entropy can only go up. Uh, and any other notion of complexity similarly. So um, you might think from my picture that, or my toy example, that this is you know, easy to find behavior, but as soon as your group gets remotely complicated, this is a very difficult question to even find examples. So uh, where, where to look? Um, to start this story of where to look, I wanna tell you some of the early history of rigidity theory, the point at which, uh, you know, by some measure dynamics passed from being the study of single maps under iteration or flows to a study of group actions on spaces where you start to leverage the algebraic structure or even the geometry of a group to understand the dynamics or the stability of its actions. And the birth of this was actually very algebraic in nature. This starts with a story of rigidity of lattices and work of Selberg in the 60s. So Selberg's breakthrough result was uh, that if you take a lattice, a discrete co-compact subgroup of the linear group S L N R, and at least three. Um, this is, is rigid or stable in the algebraic sense. 
meaning any nearby representation of this into SLNR is, is conjugate, in fact, in SLNR here to the original. And uh, this led to kind of an explosion of similar results to the 60s and 70s. The one I'm going to focus on or tell you a story about is Mostow's global rigidity of lattices. He replaced SLNR with uh, uh, PON1, the group of isometries of hyperbolic space. Better than local rigidity, where you get stability under perturbation. In fact, Mostow shows that any two co-compact co lattices are globally conjugate. They don't have to be close together. And I'm going to tell you some cartoon of Mostow's proof, but first I want to tell you what Mostow saw in Felberg's work that got him to this proof. And here's a direct quote from a survey paper Mostow wrote about his, his, his process. He writes, <clears throat> upon analyzing Selberg's proof of his rigidity theorem, the key relation shows its force as the elements product SI to the MI go to infinity. What SI are is not important. They happen to lie in some abelian subgroup. Uh, but since G, the ambient Lie group, is non-abelian, says Mostow, it seemed to me desirable to exploit relations at infinity, not only on abelian subfamilies, but among all elements of the lattice near infinity. So this is the looking to infinity that appears in the title of my talk. And uh, here's a picture of how it works. Okay, so the setup is I have a co-compact lattice in PON1. Uh, in fact, I have two and they're isomorphic. So you can see an isomorphism sort of geometric topologically as an equivariant map between the hyperbolic spaces on which these act. So I've cartooned this in a picture, uh, actually in the only dimension Mostow fails, so uh, my picture is not a lie. I really wanted these lattices to look different. So what I've drawn is uh, two actions of a lattice here, a fundamental group of a genus two surface on hyperbolic space, the usual point carry disk. And I've shown their actions by tiling by fundamental domains. And uh, uh, an isomorphism between these two groups corresponds right to a, a map that sends one tiling to another. You show that such an equivariant map extends uniquely to a homeomorphism at infinity, at the compactification of, uh, say, the Poincare ball model of hyperbolic space by a sphere at infinity. And then the key step, which is actually you know 99% of the proof, uh, is to show that this boundary map, this induced boundary map, has some regularity, uh, and and then improve this local regularity somewhere to that actually it was very regular. It came from an isometry of the of hyperbolic space itself, and that isometry is conjugates the two actions. Uh, Mostow does this. Regularity means uh, quasi conformal. You improve this to conformal using some ergodic theory. That's where all the meat is, and that's what I'm going to tell you nothing about, um, except that we should maybe take some inspiration from a boundary map at infinity or an action at infinity. Uh, being kind of the guiding principle of this rigidity result. So uh, since Mostow in his time, there's, you know, the area has not died. It has given birth to a rich study of rigidity of lattices, typically into Lie groups uh, or groups of diffeomorphisms of manifolds, uh, using all kinds of tools from smooth dynamics or homogeneous dynamics, some ergodic theory. But in the purely topological setting, there's, there's, there's a lot less, um, more of a poverty of results and techniques. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is this much less explored area of, of continuous actions and C0 stability in three different contexts where boundary maps will appear. Uh, the first is super low dimensional actions, uh, actions on the circle, which tie in with the study of orderable groups and bounded cohomology. Uh, the second is the context of uh, Gromov boundaries of hyperbolic groups, well studied in geometric group theory. And the third brings us back to actually 
very classical dynamics, the study of Anasov's lows on three dimensions. Uh, and as I mentioned, the unifying principle here is to find, you know, th there's not uh, a robust uniform technique, but there's a guiding principle to kind of look out to infinity uh, uh, to find some rigidity phenomena. Okay, so let's get started. Dimension one. Uh, I'll zoom way out again and ask a, uh, a very optimistic problem. I give you a discrete group. I give you a compact manifold. Can we, can you classify all the actions, all continuous actions of this group on this manifold? But why just describe the rigid ones? Just let's talk about all of them. And well, the problem, the answer to this question is no, uh, pretty much. Unless, you know, if your group has a lot of torsion, for instance, if it's finite, um, there's, you, you have a way to proceed. Uh, and, or, you know, if you want to use some smooth dynamics, if you replace continuous with smooth, say, then uh, there is some, there, you know, there, there is some very exciting recent work. And for this, you should go listen to the talk on the Zimmer uh, program by uh, Brown and Fisher, also part of the ICM. But in the continuous setting, the answer is no, never, unless, uh, your manifold is one dimensional. Okay. Uh, and then uh, in principle, you, you kind of can. So there's, there's sort of two pieces of evidence for this. One is, well, there's the existence question, right? Like, is there some action of your group? That's the first one you will have to answer. Um, and uh, if your manifold is the circle, the, uh, the, you can kind of answer this at least. Uh, the question whether a group admits a faithful action on the circle is semi-decidable in the sense that there's an algorithm that will say no in finite time if the answer is no, and otherwise will run forever. Okay. And this actually, you can implement this in practice if you understand your group well enough. This has been used by uh, Danny Caligar and Nathan Dunfield to answer a problem in geometric topology. They show that the Weeks manifold has no uh, taut foliation or pseudo-Nasov flow by translating it into this problem. So even if you think that circle is kind of a stupid low dimensional case, actually it's connected to very many other areas. Okay, so let's ignore the uh, existence question for a second and just try and describe all actions. This is also a kind of fundamentally algebraic question thanks to a theorem of Gis, uh, who showed that um, elements of second bounded cohomology of your group with integer coefficients a bounded uh, coma about if, if this if this uh, element admits a co-cycle that takes values only zero and one, well then that corresponds to a semi-conjugacy class of the action uh, of your group on the circle. In fact, actions up to the equivalence relation generated by semi-conjugacy uh, are exactly these elements of second bounded cohomology. So in some sense, a complete answer, uh, except in practice, this is still very hard. Second bounded cohomology is a hard thing to understand for many, many groups, it's infinite dimensional. And given a class telling you whether there's a co-cycle representative that takes only two values is also a very hard problem. So we should carefully select some gamma to study where this is you know, a little more tractable. And to do so, uh, why don't we try the lattice setting from before, that being fruitful otherwise. And here you're quickly led to uh, uh, realize that if you take the you know, semi-simple Lie group lattice situation from before, uh, the only groups that you're left with are virtually up to finite index surface groups sitting inside the Lie group of isometries of two-dimensional hyperbolic space. And, and this is exactly the place where algebraic rigidity fails, right? In fact, uh, there was always a, an at least three assumption there. In fact, here, if you have a genus G surface group, there's a 6G minus six dimensional space of deformations up to algebraic conjugacy. You can make a wonderful career just studying this space itself. Um, uh, so no algebraic rigidity, but, but all of these just as you know, if you think of these boundary, the boundary actions you get of these lattices on the circle, they're all topologically conjugate. So let's forget the Lie group for a second. 
you can actually recover rigidity by thinking of these as actions by homeomorphisms on the circle. And uh, here's a precisely what I mean by this. Uh, uh, it's made very precise by a theorem of Matsumoto, who showed uh, in 1990 that such a boundary action of the fundamental group of a surface on the circle uh, is C0 stable in the sense of my original like first slide, um, in, in not, even, not just a local, but a very strong global sense. In fact, the, the whole connected component of this action uh, in the space of all actions of the surface group on the circle is just a single semi-conjugacy class. In fact, everything can be collapsed down to the original action. Okay. So uh, uh, that's, a, that's a remark. Actually, Matsumoto shows something even a little stronger than this. Uh, but it turns out that, that uh, the converse of this is actually true. Um, in a, in a project that spanned many years with Maxime Wolf, we, we showed that these were actually kind of the only rigid examples. So if a connected component, if you have some action of your group on the circle, and it's you know some mysterious action of a service group on the circle, uh, there are many, many, many of these. And it happens to have this strong rigidity property, no matter how you deform it, uh, you know, along some long path of deformation, say, uh, you always arrive at something semi-conjugate. Well, then it was a boundary action of the standard boundary action of a surface group. Okay. Or um, there's one sort of stupid thing that can happen. The circle covers itself. So if I have an action of a group on a circle, I could try and lift it to a finite cover and I'd get another action on the circle, you know, provided it lifts. And many of these do lift. And so you get something that looks qualitatively quite the same. And it turns out these are all uh, stable as well. And, uh, uh, and that's a complete list. Okay, so this statement is really an if and only if about, you know, perhaps after up the lifting to a finite cover. So what does this do for us? Uh, uh, amazingly, it gives us a complete description of many connected components of the space of actions of a surface group on a circle. Um, a space which has a has kind of important uh, uh, interpretations in foliation theory and, and sort of understanding foliations on three manifolds. But um, we're sort of far from done. For instance, it's a completely open question whether uh, this space has finitely many connected components or infinitely many. We've identified a bunch of them. As G goes up, actually, the number of these uh, ones we can talk about that are all stable actions grows exponentially. Um, but, uh, uh, but I don't know. Uh, this question is so why? I mean, one approach to this, you might want to try and prove that every action of a surface group on the circle could be deformed to have an image inside of some Lie group acting on the circle. Uh, if that's true, you'd get a finiteness resolved right away. So I'm gonna give you a very cartoon idea of the proof um, because this technique inspired a lot of future work. Here's the cartooniest idea possible. I have my surface and I've drawn three curves on it. And uh, up here on the universal cover, I've done the universal cover and uh, those faced curves correspond to elements of, a fun of the fundamental group. And I've shown their action by deck transformations on the universal cover, the dynamics of this. They all each translate along an axis. Okay. And the action on the boundary uh, of each of these elements has a single source and a single sink. Um, and the configuration of curves on the surface actually tells me the configuration of these source sinks at infinity. If you see A and B, right, they're, they're linked on the surface in the sense that even if I release them from their base point and allow them to freely homotope around, they'll always be intersect non-trivially. Whereas C, if I you know, perform some free homotopy, I can make this disjoint from A and B. And this is witnessed upstairs by the fact that the axes of A and B cross or that their fixed points are what I call linked, right? Uh, a fixed point of A separates the, two, separates the two fixed points of B, 
whereas C is unlinked with A and B. Okay, so now I can try and do some deformations. It's very explicit deformation I can do, we call bending after the same kind of thing you do with quasi Fuchsian groups. Okay. You can replace the element A with a composition with a one parameter family of homeomorphisms that commute with B. You can do this without changing, uh, without changing B or C at all. And as you do this, typically, well, the dynamics of A will change and its fixed points will persist, but they'll move around. Okay. But they're forced to move within a constrained area. You can verify this by hand for this example that I've drawn. And in particular, they'll, you'll never be able to move them so far as to link with C or to unlink with B by doing this type of deformation, which is good because uh, I just told you by Matsumoto's theorem, this kind of action is stable. So the picture you get should, should persist up to conjugacy under any kind of deformation. And we show morally that the goal of the proof is to show that this behavior is completely characteristic. If, if you have an action that's rigid to begin with, we wanna show it comes from one of these boundary actions. Well, first of all, you show that actually simple curves do act with fixed points. Okay. And secondly, you show that the configuration has to be exactly uh, the same boundary configuration as it was before. If things appear in the wrong order, if something's linked that wasn't linked on your original surface, you can judiciously do such a deformation to change the cyclic order of points, to move this around, and then all, all of a sudden A is linked with C. Right. And so you conclude that any rigid action has exactly this standard ordering and can promote that to uh, that rigid action actually was semi conjugate to the original. The only problem with that story is it's sort of a lie. Um, that's, that's, that's the guiding principle, but in practice, lots goes wrong. Uh, first of all, there's the lift to finite cover issue. So you're not dealing with trying to find fixed points, you have periodic points. And Secondly, there's the up to semi conjugacy issue, which from my first slide, you now imagine that typically instead of dealing with something with a, you know, an isolated fixed or periodic point, you maybe have a whole pile of them or a canter set worth or goodness knows what. And so you have to invent an entire machine to keep, keep track of this kind of moral scheme of what's going on. Okay, okay so you do this hard thing, but having done it, uh, you now have a superpower to deal with all kinds of other actions, but uh, questions about groups acting on the circle. Uh, for instance, we proved a global rigidity for mapping class groups, answering a question of Benson Farb. If you take a mapping class group, the group of homeomorphisms up to isotopy of a surface with a marked point, your isotopy has to preserve this marked point, is a very natural action on the circle that comes from the picture right there. Um, that marked point allows you to canonically lift any homeomorphism fixing that point up to the universal cover fixing a, you know a particular choice of lift of that marked point point. and if you vary this up to isotopy you don't change the induced action at infinity on the boundary so the mapping class group has a well-defined action uh, on this circle at infinity and farb asked if this was the only faithful one well in fact it's the only non-trivial one uh, this also led to so a study of the algebraic questions, the spaces of circular orders on groups. In the interest of time, I won't really go into that, but there's a whole other avenue you can, you can pursue. Uh, instead, I want to go in a different direction of generalization, which is going to go up in dimension of boundary space from the circle. So that most maybe naive way we can do this is just instead of taking a surface take a manifold of higher dimension if you take a compact Ramanian manifold with uh, that emits a metric of negative uh, sectional curvature then its universal cover much like hyperbolic space well it now has some metric of varying but bounded negative curvature and you can compactify such a space by a sphere at infinity which you know, kind of captures visually the ways of looking out, uh, out to the out, out, you know, to the beyond. And what negative curvature buys you is that you get a well-defined action of your fundamental group, 
well, the action of your fundamental group by deck transformations on the universal cover extends to an action on this boundary at infinity by homeomorphisms. But in fact, you can even do something more general than that. If I take a finally generated hyperbolic group in the sense of Gromov, this is a, even a coarser notion of hyperbolicity, uh, its Cayley graph can be compactified by some kind of boundary at infinity. And uh, the group acts naturally on this boundary by homeomorphisms. Okay, so although I said Cayley graph here, uh, the notation boundary gamma is not a mistake. It, this, as a topological space, it only depends on the group. Um, and it's not hard to define. It's equivalence classes of geodesic rays, where two geodesic rays are equivalent if they fellow travel each other for all time, they remain bounded distance. Okay. And so again, it sort of captures the lines of sight to infinity. And what hyperbolic or some kind of coarsened version of negative curvature buys you is that if you take a geodesic ray and you hit it with an element of your group, you get something that still has a well-defined endpoint at infinity. So you get an action by homeomorphisms. Okay, so as a cartoon example, I drew you the Cayley graph of a standard generating set for the free group. And it's boundary at infinity is really just gonna be all the ends of this space in this, in this question. You'll get it in this case, you'll get a Cantor set. And in general, well, if you had the fundamental group of a Ramanian manifold of a negative curvature, you'll get a sphere, uh, just like my first point, you get that same visual boundary. Typically, you get some uh, terrible or interesting, depending on your perspective, uh, type of thing, like a Sierpinski carpet or a Menger sponge. Uh, we don't have a complete list of, you know, what topological spaces are the boundaries of groups. Uh, but we do get a very rich collection of groups acting on spaces, any Gromov hyperbolic group acting on its boundary. And the dynamics of these actions have been very well studied over a long period of time uh, through work of starting with Gromov, but also through work of Sullivan and Kennan and Bowditch and many more up to the present day. Uh, in fact, you can even following work of Bowditch, you can characterize hyperbolic group acting on boundary uh, by a dynamical condition called the convergence group uh, condition. But what surprised me is sort of no one had completely probed the stability question for these actions. Can I have a group acting on a space? Can I mess it up uh, until recently? And in, in work first starting with Jonathan Bowden for the manifold case, um, and then more generally with Jason Manning, and finally the completely general case very recently with Teddy Weissman, we showed that these have the topological stability property that I mentioned at the beginning. Each one of these examples, the action of any hyperbolic group on its boundary satisfies topological stability. You perturb it, it's always semi-conjugate to the original. The proof of this, starting with the manifold case, uh, we very heavily leaned on the geometry of, uh, of the ambient space. Um, you can do kind of a standard suspension construction of an action to build a foliated space that captures this dynamics. Uh, in the case of a, of a manifold fundamental group and its visual boundary sphere, what you build is actually something that looks like the unit tangent bundle of your manifold. And we use that sort of that structure in the proof. We're able to see a boundary in here in two different ways. And and understand a perturbation of the action as a, as a map between such spaces. And, uh, and, and it is very geometric topological. Um, this doesn't really work if your boundary is something you don't even know what it is because you had a general hyperbolic group. And so to solve this generally, we had to back way up and, and come up with a different argument that much more resembles a coding style argument uh, used by S Sullivan. That's it's very kind of more in the spirit of symbolic dynamics. But I think both these, I mean, both of these are parallel arguments that have been used in other, other fields, and, uh, and it's, it gives you really two approaches to attacking the same kind of problem. But uh, what I would really like to see, and here's the vaguest of vague open questions, uh, can you do some kind of uh, uh, converse-ish result in the spirit of, you know, my work with Maxime Wolf?
in any sense are the only like rigid or strongly rigid actions or you know insert enough adjectives to make this true of 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 hyperbolic groups on boundary like spaces exactly or up to something these boundary ones see how much i'm hedging here because i don't know exactly what the conjecture but something in there should be true okay so this brings me kind of to the third and final piece of the talk where we see boundary actions and uh and this goes back to a very very classical uh question in dynamics which is uh stability of flows so in the in the 1960s uh Dmitry Anasov was studying geodesic flow on manifolds of negative curvature and uh and and, and this is, the, you know, geodesic flow in this setting has this remarkable, you know, at the, at, the, at the same time, it's chaotic and predictable, meaning that locally, you know, if you take two different trajectories and you flow, you have, you know, if you start slightly away from you are and you sort of follow, your, your paths will diverge wildly. So this is kind of a local chaotic behavior. Orbits diverge very quickly. Uh, but globally, what he showed was these were stable. If you take the whole dynamical system and you perturb it a bit, you get something that's conjugate to the original. Okay, and the, the, the way that this worked had was not you know, completely special to geodesic flow and negative curvature. Um, what was special about it is it had some kind of directions of expansivity and contractivity, if I can invent that word. Um, and it led to the abstract de definition of an Anasov flow is something that has exactly this behavior. So, uh, roughly speaking, a flow on a manifold is Anasov if it has invariant, a pair of invariant transverse laminations, uh, sorry, foliations, leaves of one intersect leaves of another along an orbit of the flow. Um, so, in particular, that gives you a constraint on exactly dimension of leaves, they intersect only on orbits. And in dimension three, which is what I'll talk about, these are two dimensional foliations. And on leaves of one, orbits converge on a single leaf. And on leaves of the other, this happens in backwards time. So orbits diverge or more precisely converge in backwards time. And you can frame, frame this very efficiently in terms of some invariant splitting of the tangent bundle of your manifold and talk about the derivative of the time p map of the flow. But it's this picture cartoon that I want you to have actually in mind. Okay, so that was 1960s. Starting from the 1970s, uh, there was a great wealth of work on, on studying new, creating new examples, new and unusual examples of these, and then trying to classify them. In dimension three is where this is really tractable. Uh, the situation is, is much harder on n manifolds as n gets bigger. But in dimension three, there's a beautiful relationship between the geometry and topology of the manifold and the types of flows it can support. The first new examples were done all, all around the same time by Franks and Williams, Handel, Thurston, Sue Goodman, David Fried. Uh, they developed surgery type techniques, either Dane surgery along a closed orbit or kind of cut and paste type techniques that allowed you to take two manifolds that had an Anasov flows and do glue them together, uh, surgery them, do some operation and produce a new manifold with a new Anasov flow. So this gave a kind of a wealth of different examples. But typically when you do this procedure, you change not just the flow, but you change the manifold itself. And uh, so there was kind of a question for a long time hanging of, of, well, can you have many really different flows on the same, you know, topological manifold, three manifold? And this was only answered in uh, 2014. Uh, Bonatti began, you gave examples of uh, manifolds that admitted arbitrarily many and also have flows. So you give me a number 100, they'll build your manifold that has 100 distinct ones. Um, they used transverse tori crucially. So there was still a question of whether you could do this on hyperbolic manifolds. That's actually yeah, that's a Kirby's problem list question. And uh, Jonathan Bowden and I recently answered, yes, you can. You can do this even on hyperbolic manifolds. And very recently, Adam Clay and Tali Pinsky came up with a third argument that lets you build lots of examples. So, so the situation is rich. 
Okay. Uh, although we still don't know if this is inherently finite, um, uh, that's an interesting open question that we can't test. But once you have examples, right, you want to classify them. Uh, and also, I owe you a definition of what does it mean to be the same or different, right? I haven't told you. Of, of course, you can change a flow by saying flow faster, right? You can reparametize time. That's cheating, right? That shouldn't give you something new. For me, uh, the definition of the same or different should depend on whether the orbits look, you know, foliate your manifold in the same way or not. So this is the definition of orbit equivalence. So two flows for us are on a manifold are the same, they're orbit equivalent. There's some homeomorphism of their manifold that takes orbits of one to orbits of the other. So if you're a topologist rather than a dynamicist, you can't see the passage of time. You just see the way the orbits are cutting up your manifold. This is your definition of same versus different. Okay, so if we wanna solve my previous question, like, uh, you know, do I have infinitely many distinct ones on this manifold that I just cooked up some examples? Are they the same? Are they different? Uh, we need an invariant to distinguish them. And here's one invariant called the free homotopy spectrum. So I have a periodic orbit of my flow, something that comes back to itself, right? It's a closed loop in my manifold and just take its free homotopy class. So sitting inside this set of all free homotopy classes of loops, conjugacy classes in pi one, I just record the ones that are represented by periodic orbits, unoriented. I don't care what direction you were going because orbit equivalence here doesn't see that. And so trivially, if you have an orbit equivalence, right, that map induces some map on pi one on three homotopy classes, and it'll take this spectrum of one flow to the spectrum of the other. And a program which has now been many years in, in the making, but is very near completion uh, in joint work with Thomas Bartelme and now also with Stephen Frankel, we're showing that this is a complete invariant. So for anosov flows, or even for a generalization of this, where you allow some singular orbits called pseudo anosov flows uh, on compact three manifolds, under the assumption that at least one of them is topologically transitive, this, this is the condition you need to guarantee that you have lots enough of periodic orbits for this set to be meaningful. Um, then, uh, then the free homotopy spectrum is, is a complete invariant. If there's some automorphism of pi one of your manifold, or I guess some induced map on free homotopy classes that takes the spectrum of one flow to the spectrum of another, well, they were orbit equivalent, and your orbit equivalence induces this, you know, this map that you had to begin with. Uh, and Okay, so now you're wondering what did this have to do with this talk so far? Where is infinity? Um, we're coming to this. I'll tell you kind of the key part that makes this classification theorem work, that makes it all come together. And 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 this is really the perspective that that leads to a proof. So what you can do if you have a, a an OSA flow or pseudo an OSA flow on a Three manifold. My pictures will say anasov. Forget I told you what pseudo anasov was. Um, uh, you can lift this flow to the universal cover of your three manifold, which by classical results is uh, your manifold has to be aspherical. Its universal cover is R3. It's now I have a flow on R3. And I can collapse each orbit of this flow down to a single point. And it turns out when you do this, you get a topological plane. That's a uh, shown by Barbeau and Fenley independently in their study of this. And the foliations that came from the expanding and contracting foliations of your flow now descend to two transverse foliations by lines on the plane. So this is an honest local picture. Uh, moreover, right, your fundamental group acts by deck transformations on the universal cover. And since your flow came from downstairs, it preserves leaves and sends leaves to leaves preserve these foliations. And so uh, this action descends to an action by homeomorphisms on the plane that preserves these two transverse foliations. 
So I guess I drew you a local picture, uh, but the global picture can be extremely complicated. Right? I, I, uh, I have here examples where I have a sequence of leaves of one foliation that limit, you know, a sequence of individual leaves limits onto a union, finite or infinite of leaves. It's gonna happen in both leaf spaces. Uh, uh, you, can, you can fail to have that property and still not be trivial. The global picture is extremely complicated in general. But uh, this plane can be compactified by a, a circle at infinity right, in a natural way so that the action of your fundamental group extends to an action on this circle. And what, what we do, the, the heart of this proof is to translate the free homotopy spectrum into statements about acting with fixed points on the plane in the boundary circle. You know, if you have a periodic orbit, what happens when you pass to this orbit space is that element of your fundamental group, well, it fixes now a point right, that corresponds to that the orbit that was periodic. And then it, so it fixes the leaves or permutes the leaves to that point. So you can kind of understand what's happening on the circle, which behaves a little bit like endpoints of leaves. Um, and, uh, and this gives you sort of a rich dynamical action of a group on both the plane and a compactified circle at infinity. And you, the, the underlying philosophy is to show that if you have enough information about which uh, elements have fixed points and how they're configured or not, you can reconstruct this whole action up to conjugacy. And that can be promoted to an orbit equivalence between flows. Okay, so uh, that's a near finished near proof theorem, which I hope you will see sometime soon. And I think an illustration of how uh, going out to infinity can even make an appearance, you know, an action of discrete groups considered at infinity uh, can help you solve a problem that a priori has nothing to do with that, right? A problem about a classification of continuous group actions and also flows on three manifolds. Okay. I'll just conclude with one final kind of next frontier question. This is all dimension three, as well as my open question about find a three manifold with infinitely many flow, anasa flows, compact three manifold, infinitely many anasa flows, or prove none exist. Uh, the, the door is wide open in higher dimensions. Um, and, you know, there's something to look at for the next 50 years. It's, uh, it's what can you do on, uh, for NASA flows, maybe co-dimension one ones on N manifolds. Thanks very much. Thank you, Katrin, uh, for a very interesting talk. And I would like to thank the audience for joining us.